Well, I hope that meditation was helpful for you. Uh, for me, it was certainly. And it's an example uh, and an introduction into what I hope to explore with you, which I want to warn you, it might seem a little fuzzy initially, but it's actually very much about how we can experience an underlying ground of resilient well being and peacefulness even in a challenging world, even while facing and feeling really difficult things. So I kind of invite you to strap on your seatbelt and hang out with me as I do a pretty deep dive into uh, deep kinds of practice. So here we go. Uh, I want to talk about, in effect, two distinctions. The first distinction is between becoming and being. The second distinction I'll get to in our experience is between figure and ground. Let me see if I can make sense out of this. So I want to start with a quotation from the Buddha, from the Dhammapada. Wonderful it is to train the mind, so swiftly moving, seizing whatever it wants. Good it is to have a well-trained mind, for a well-trained mind brings happiness. One of the most fundamental research findings on our brain is that essentially it's a prediction machine. It's an expectation machine that's continually leaning into the future, continually uh, imagining different possibilities, forming different expectations, simple things like how heavy a water puddle will be, makes a prediction, and then it matches the sensory feedback from lifting the water bottle to that prediction and revises accordingly. And in this process of generating expectations, we are continuously drawn into becoming. And we are drawn into chasing various goals and becoming certain people, in effect, who we are becoming as we accomplish this goal, get that feedback from somebody else, end up in that position in a certain situation with other people. You know, who are we becoming? And you can actually observe this ongoing process in your mind, driven by your brain, of, in effect, chasing the future. It's so pervasive. It's so ubiquitous that it's like the proverbial water in which the fish swim without realizing that they are continually wet. See if you can observe your own mind leaving the present again and again, even during this talk, uh, in different kinds of becoming. Now, it's not that this movement toward becoming and who we are becoming and what we are getting and what we will come to, come to be, it's not that it's inherently problematic. It's actually a great way to keep animals alive in the wild and to develop cortical networks, especially in the midline of the human species, that give us this incredible machinery inside our own head that is able to move back and forth between the past and the future. The problem is that this process of becoming leans very much into a sense of contraction, tension, selfing, craving, and suffering. As we reach again and again, as the quotation from the Dhammapada said, as we reach again and again and again for into the future. The mind routinely takes, you know, very fluid, dynamic, uh, fuzzy boundary you know, reality and essentializes it into various things and then forms expectations about the rewards of getting those things or how good it will feel to avoid the bad things and then gets caught up continuously in this machinery of becoming. You can feel it. You can feel the subtle tension in it. 
you can feel very gross forms of getting caught up kind of in imagining and insisting a way it needs to be. When I think about my own trouble, you know, my troubles, plural, with different people over the many years I've been alive, when I look at almost every single one of them, you know, my own contribution to the trouble, whatever their contribution was, my own contribution often boiled down to insisting in some way that the future be a certain way. In effect, insisting on a certain kind of becoming that reality would become, that other people would become, or that I would become. And in that contracted, pressurized insistence, suffering was born again and again and again. The problem to repeat is not this biologically grounded process of prediction, plan, feedback, revision, onward, occurring typically in multiple channels at any time in your brain about multiple things. The problem is not that per se. The problem is that we get lost in it. We lose mindfulness of it, and we become habitual and caught up into certain forms of insistence and grasping and positionality and a lot of me caught up in it with regard to you know, becoming, rather than resting in a sense of being. You can feel the difference between the two. You can feel what it's like actually let's say during a structured meditation like what we just did, to rest in being in the present without an agenda, without any movement into becoming. I have a little personal mantra. It might sound a little weird or abstract, but it, I don't know, works for me. <laughs> Releasing, I mean, basically what it says is, the my mantra is receiving appearing. The present moment is continually appearing. Receiving appearing, that whatever is appearing, the sound, the sight, the thought, the memory, the emotion, receiving appearing, releasing, becoming. You try it. And you can see it's actually kind of hard in the beginning probably. But as you start to get more used to it, wow. <laughs> So peaceful, so present, so at ease, so simple, so right under our noses that we can take refuge in simply being. Now, I'll get to this in a minute. How do we rest in being while purposefully becoming? <laughs> you know, while writing an email, offering a talk, hanging out with a friend, doing the dishes getting ready for bed, you know, talking with your friend. Um, how do we do all that while feeling that we're mainly rested in a ground of being? And I think in many ways I'm summarizing the heart of practice or a major piece of practice. Here's another quotation from the Buddha that speaks to this. Let go of the past. Let go of the future. Let go of the present as it appears, and cross over to the farther shore of existence, which I'll be getting to. With mind wholly liberated, you shall come no more to birth and death, which we can understand as the birth and death of our own individual body, but more fundamentally, we can understand that we, we disengage uh, when we're utterly radically in the present, we kind of step out of you know, the, the, the sweep of arising and passing away because we're just here in the present. We've let go of the past, let go of the future, and let go of the present in a kind of time, into a kind of timelessness. So I invite you, it might seem kind of really abstract, try to be aware of your own process of becoming. And getting caught up in this endless machinery of planning and grasping or resisting, you know, what the future may be. So that's, that's the first distinction between becoming and being. And to rest increasingly in being, you can do meditations like we've done. It helps to have a sense of, you know, 
being in the present and present moment awareness that tends to also disrupt becoming. And it also helps to become disenchanted of a lot of what we reach for and to realize increasingly it's not so great. You know, the brain has a kind of inner advertising agency that's continually trying to hype up the rewards of what we are trying to become or what we are trying to make come into being. And when you actually have that thing happen or taste that cookie or have that person do that thing, eh, maybe it's nice, maybe it's okay, but it's usually not all that it was advertised to be because we have an inner ad agency that's continually trying to motivate us as big monkeys to keep making things come into being in order to pass on genes that pass on genes. So one way you can help yourself is to become increasingly disenchanted, as the Buddha taught, about these various things that the mind tends to naturally grasp after. And you can play around, as I do, in really practical ways with what's it like to sustain a sense of being, a kind of spaciousness of being as actions occur. It's helpful to do actions kind of slowly, you know, reach for the bottle of water kind of slowly and mindfully rather than habitually jerking your arm over there, you know, for example, and see what it's like to realize that you can rest in being while talking with someone. You can rest in being while receiving ideas, uh, getting information, making sense of it. Uh, notice the tendency to contract out of being into becoming and getting invested in the future. You know, there's a saying that if you don't want to be disappointed, don't get appointed to a particular version of the future. Um, and see what that's like. You know, you can really help yourself with this. Okay. A related distinction is between figure and ground. And what I mean by that is that we can be aware of having particular thoughts, particular desires, particular sounds, sights, passing through awareness, fine. But more deeply and increasingly, we can have a sense of the field, the ground of awareness in which those experiences are occurring. And if you like, you can imagine the metaphor of a pond. Mind as like a pond. And there's the surface of the pond, which is ruffled by various waves, various ripples as the wind blows across it, or as some people maybe toss a stone or two into the pond, the ripples go out. There are, there are ripples on the surface of the pond. Those are the figures, as it were. And then there is the ground. There is the surface of the pond altogether as a single unified field in which many patterns are occurring. See that? It might seem abstract, but again, if we look closely at our, our own experience, so much of our suffering structurally boils down to identifying with particular ripples moving through the field of awareness or resisting uh, certain ripples or chasing after other ones. That's it. And so much of the instruction of the great teachers and so many traditions is to increasingly recognize this process of identification, grasping and aversion with regard to various ripples in the pond of the mind and instead gradually, gradually abide as the field of awareness as a whole. To do that, it helps to do practices that over time, um, as the Buddha taught, tranquilize the body, tranquilize the mind, and, and bring a certain resting that becomes increasingly a, as a trait, a kind of way of regularly being. So that, that helps some of the more agitated ripples settle down. There's certainly a place for practical steps you know, for um, intervening or acting as best one can in one's circumstances. You know, if you're in a situation in which people are dropping boulders into your pond routinely, 
you know, as much as you can, there's a place we're trying to deal with that, whether it's at the immediate level of your own life or working with others or on your own in, at larger and larger scales, including social policy, public policy and politics to, you know, like poverty is a daily cascade of boulders into the ponds of, of people who are dealing with it. For example, racism, you know, being on the receiving end of bias of various kinds, you know, including at a, you know, hearing in the United States Senate, you know, there are a lot of, you know, ponds, I mean, boulders coming at a person. Um, certainly there's a place for doing what we can in that regard. Certainly there's a place for doing what we can, at the level of the physical body um, to, you know, reduce the things that agitate uh, the mind there as best we can, such as chronic pain. All right. That said, you know, certainly as the Buddha taught, um, or as Alan Watts said, life is wiggly. You know, life is bumpy. Uh, a lot of things happen. And over time, what we can do is train ourselves so that more and more, even as ripples inevitably come and go through our, through our awareness, more and more we identify with the field. More and more we identify with the ground. And here's where these two distinctions come together. Like I said, becoming distinct from being and figure distinct from ground. Because you notice that as you start to increasingly rest in being, whether in specific periods of meditation or other kinds of practice, or as it becomes more and more native to you as a trait, as kind of where you dwell and what dwells within you, as you get more and more settled into being, you find that you are more and more rested in the ground of awareness. The two come together. It's a beautiful thing. It's like coming home, resting, resting. You don't have to solve all the problems of all the ripples moving through awareness. We do what we can, but <laughs> there's no end to them. <laughs> you may have noticed. <laughs> right? Waves keep on coming. Whoa, here comes another one. <laughs> more and more, what we're able to do, though, is simply rest in a sense of being, distinct from chasing various kinds of becoming, and rest in the field, the field of awareness through which experiences are passing. This is very central to practice particularly as practice matures. You find people who are farther and farther along, they're more and more rested in this, in this combination, really, of being and awareness, and being and, and the ground of awareness uh, as a kind of context in which uh, different kinds of thoughts and feelings and different kinds of ways of being functional occur. This is like a roadmap. This is a roadmap or fundamental kind of practice. Yeah. And it's because it's kind of like it's hard for the fish to comprehend that it's wet, right? When your mind gets quieter, you become you know, less caught up in the agitation of the ripples, the waves passing through awareness, and you have more and more of a sense of, oh, there is awareness itself. Awareness as a kind of field uh, through which experiences occur. Uh, a more, you know, maybe technical, technological kind of metaphor is a TV set. Uh, there's the field of the screen or any kind of screen, and then there's everything passing through it. But what's passing through or passing in and over the field of the, t of the screen is comes and goes, but the screen is stable. The screen endures. As long as we have a basic functioning nervous system, that underlying field of being and field of awareness is stable. It's not impermanent over the course of this lifespan. It's stable, basically, 
through which all kinds of unstable and unsatisfying experiences come and go. Now I want to really mess with you. <laughs> so far, I've talked here about our experience. And I've just tried to point to, and I'm not, it's not that I'm trying to convince you, it's that I'm trying to point to what's actually here already. Becoming occurs in a field of being. Experiences occur in a field of awareness. And um, chasing becoming and chasing experiences in various ways is a sure prescription for suffering and harm. Creates so much tension for ourselves and others. And the opportunity is to have more and more of a direct experience of simply being, or more and more of an ex of experience of being awareness in which experiences are passing. And this may start conceptual for you, and you might be shaking your head thinking, what? <laughs> Rick, <laughs> you've been gone for a few weeks. What have you been doing? <laughs> this is a little out there. You might be thinking that. It's okay. Because when you just kind of look directly and settle in, you realize, wow, I can simply be. There is awareness in which experiences are happening. Wow, no problem. That's available to us. And now I want to take it two steps further, and then I'll shut up and see what you have to say about this. So far, I've talked about how it is in our experience, in effect, subjectively. But I want to extend this objectively because it's a fact that we can understand that our experiences, you know, our ongoing sense of being, which is a kind of experience, it's a kind of mental phenomenon, the sense of being, and the field of awareness, also a kind of mental phenomenon. These mental phenomena arise dependent upon underlying physical, material, biological, neurological processes. We are a mind-body process, and this body in which the mind rests, as I've described it, including its fundamental attributes of beingness and awareness, the body in which this mind rests is a local ripple itself in the larger pond of the whole Big Bang universe. That's true. That's not me being kind of ecstatically poetic. It's actually true. And a person might, as Henry Shuckman, guest taught, Stephen Snyder, guest taught, and some people have spoken of in our group, our Sangha, when people have radical, non-dual, self-transcendent experiences, these are the major descriptors of these, self-transcendent, non-dual experiences, in which the sense of self falls away, and there's a complete sense of immersion in reality altogether, radiant reality altogether, with no problem, that's, that's a radical immersion in the truth of what I'm talking about. And then, and many, many people have had those experiences, uh, usually without psychedelics and sometimes with. Uh, we can also have brief glimpses or knowings of the full truth of that multiple times a day where we really get, wow, this moment of experience, hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, consciousness, this moment of experience is simply a local manifestation of the whole universe operating. Wow. So we have a second kind of ground. The first kind is the subject of ground 
of being and awareness as an attribute of our mind. All right. And resting in that ground of the mind is itself a release from suffering and harming oneself and others. That's great. That particular ground rests in the fundamental ground of physical reality altogether. And you can have kind of a intuition of that and a growing sense of that and occasionally perhaps radical self-transcendent breakthroughs into that realization. I have found for me that, because I'm a conceptual kind of guy, it has helped to understand this conceptually, that this moment of hearing and seeing and tasting and remembering and so forth is being constructed continuously by physical processes in my body that are nested in and extend out into and are very fuzzily distinct from, you know, life and earth and oxygen and trees and sunlight and gravity and the Milky Way galaxy and all the rest of that. That's the ground of all in ordinary reality. Through which all kinds of things pass, gophers and galaxies and you and I are ripples in the vast pond of the Big Bang universe. And we can have an intuition of the pond altogether, of the universe altogether, in which we are a local manifestation. That's available to us, actually, in a growing way, especially as practice deepens. And then, to really go all the way, many people stop here. And I, I respect that. I'm fine with it. That's kind of the view of scientific materialism. This is it. It's just the clockwork Big Bang universe unfolding in remarkable ways. All right. My sense, though, is that there's more to it than that. There is, as the Buddha pointed to, in my view, beyond words, a kind of unconditioned ground in which the conditioned Big Bang universe is unfolding in which our own local consciousness is occurring. And this deepest ground of all is the territory, as people point to it, beyond language of timelessness, it's eternal, unconditioned, the absolute. Stephen Snyder talks about an attribute of it as, as he calls it absence. It's not that it's void, it's that there's this there's a there's a possibility in which actuality is unfolding. Some speak to this as as God, this ultimate ground of all, the divine, you know, the mystery, the absolute, whatever it may be. And I don't say this to convince you, but I say it to name what could well be your sense of things as well. And so to finish here. If we imagine, you know, or a way of looking at really deep practice, I myself, when I first kind of came back to Buddhism, you know, I first encountered it through Zen a little bit, mainly through reading in the 1970s, wandered around a little bit, and then got connected with Spirit Rock, I think in the 80s or 90s, um, probably the early 1990s. And then um, it was great stuff. That said, I have found a lot of what I think of as Western Buddhism as kind of Buddhism light. It's good. It's good stuff, you know, self-awareness, kindness, good. It's great. But the real radical depth of the Buddhist teachings, I wasn't made aware of it really until much later on, even though it's, it's right there. It's available, certainly. Um, with a little bit of reading or a little bit of, of inquiry. And I want to talk, I'm trying to talk about that depth of practice right here. So if I can, just to finish and summarize, we have an opportunity in our personal practice, because that's what this is about. This is not about theology or philosophy or me propounding some kind of view. It's about us practicing. We can practice 
increasingly deepening our living sense of beingness and awareness in the present, even as we engage life. And we can second, you know, extend that sense of the ground, recognize that that ground, that ground of being rests in a vaster ground of the universe altogether, including its kind of underlying quantum field. That's the fundamental substrate of physical reality. We can have an intuition of that and a sense of openness into that and a connecting with that. And if it's meaningful for you, you even can have an intuition of the deepest ground of all, of the unconditioned, timelessness, the absolute, which may well be, as many people talk about and experience, which may may well be infused with a kind of awareness, a non-local, non-personal consciousness, awareness, and benevolence, even, a kind of love. Three grounds that we can feel increasingly at home in. This is the truth of our nature. We're evolved in some ways to be deluded away from knowledge of this nature and recognition of it, but with a little bit of practice, a little bit of training, a little bit of patience and time, you really can, we really can rest in the feeling of these three kinds of ground. Really? (laughs) Okay, so I'm going to see what's been said. It's okay if this is confusing. This is, you know, something to become more and more, you know, focus on it through your own experience, especially the first kind of ground that I talked about. What's it like? to be in the present without seeking anything, without having an agenda? What's it like to listen to another person with no expectation or agenda? That's an example of simply being. Um, Can you have a sense of your own field of awareness in which thoughts are occurring or sounds are occurring? What's the field in which hearing is occurring directly. You can, you can recognize that directly. Uh, okay. So let's see, any questions or comments? So I got a question from Tony at 654. If you use your name, I'll repeat your name. Otherwise, if it's private to me, I won't use your name. Um, I think it was related to my own personal mantra, sort of a receiving appearing in the present. Whatever's ap- appearing, receiving it, whoosh, as it passes on by, releasing, becoming. Receiving, appearing, releasing, becoming. It's not that I'm trying to you know, order you to do that. It's more like I'm just sharing something that's been kind of, it's a weird mantra, right? And it works for me. So does releasing, um, releasing for me means disengaging from that mechanical movement into becoming that's so habitual and kind of biologically rooted. That's what it really means to me. Um, Okay, good. I can see good comments. Um, Yeah, so I got a private message, someone struggling with um, a serious illness. and who basically describe, who says, I've described how you're feeling, and this person understandably is worn out from becoming. I really get it. Um, Any suggestions for turning off becoming? So I wanna wanna just mention a few. One, awareness of spaciousness. Neurologically and otherwise, as soon as we start to get a sense just of kind of spaciousness, or you lift your eyes up from whatever you're looking at that's close to you, out to the horizon, that naturally tends to move us into a sense of the, of the field, the ground, and away from particular parts inside it, including our own personal egocentric point of view. That's one. 
Second, as much as possible, be aware of the sense of pressure or contraction that pulls us into the figure and pulls us into becoming. And instead, move more into, as best you can, releasing contraction and releasing the sense of pressure. If you need to be contracted in the moment to survive or take care of somebody else, you do. Um, or be pressured. I know what that's like. You know, in certain situations, boom, you got to deal with it. But when it's not necessary, see if you can be mindful of it and release and relax it. And then the other one, which is the ultimate for me, it's the ultimate medicine, it's the go-to, is some sense of warm-heartedness and love. You know, as soon as we start having a sense of warm-heartedness and lovingness flowing out and flowing in, whoosh, that tends to open us out into the ground of being more broadly and tends to relax and release the self-contraction. So, okay, I see people whose hands raise. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Anya Net. I'm going to ask you to unmute. And if you could turn on your camera, that's great. But if not, no worries. As always, not personal. You've probably heard me say it. Uh, please be succinct and focus on what I'm talking about tonight. Okay, go for it. So great to see you, Rick. Good to see you too. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to use a specific example for my question. Um, I'm changing careers and starting an art business, and which has been my dream. And before I did this, I sort of sketched out some intentions of things that I would love, just intentions. And I, I'm, I'm starting the day looking at those. And my question for you is, how do you have intention, yeah. but not ch chase yeah. and grasp? It, and I is it even good to have intention? I'm like, oh my goodness. Yeah. You're right on the bullseye of a key question, right? Uh, how do we, you know, bring a business into the world? How do we bring a child into the world? How do we bring, how do we have the intention of peace in Ukraine and elsewhere? How, how do we do that, right? Uh, how, um, how do we have good intentions for ourselves? Do we want to help ourselves be less stressed about this and, you know, more peaceful and happy about that? Um, the Buddha distinguished between basically craving and wholesome desire. And the words in Pali are tanha and chanda. Just helps to understand there are these two notions. The Buddha was not against desire per se. He really spoke about problematic desire and problematic relationships, even to healthy desires. So for me, I kind of summarize this as, and I'm gonna use the word wholesome, you can choose a different word if you like, Wholesome desires pursued with wholesome means while fundamentally being at peace with the results, without craving, in other words, in relationship to those. Now, that's a high bar, but we can keep working with it. That's the standard. So it's like a little mental checklist. Okay, what's, you know, is this a, is this a worthy aim, vision, value, desire? Yes, good. I'm for it. I'm for you having that, Anyanette. It's okay to, for the, you be for it too. All right, good one. Second, how are you pursuing it? Now, are you pursuing it by being mean and nasty to everybody, lying and cheating? You know, I don't know, you know, poisoning babies? No. Okay, fine. You're pursuing it with, you know, you're staying inside the, the lines of creating a business, you're being appropriate about it. You're not lying, you're not misrepresenting thing. You've got right livelihood. You know, you're working that in terms of the Eightfold Path. Great. Okay, check that box. Then the really tricky one. Hmm. Can you pursue this wholesome goal with wholesome methods without being contracted, pressured, caught up in problematic self-referentialness, you know, ego, ego, ego. Can you do that? That's where the growing edge is for okay. me. The third one is my hardest. Yeah, yeah, me too. That's, that's understandable. So that's where we work, right? That's where we work. And so it's really okay to have wholesome desires. It's really okay to pursue them. And where we practice a lot is finding ways to do it with a sense of spaciousness. Notice when, we, notice when we're getting caught up in insisting. I find that the sense of contraction, pressure, and insistence must, musting our way through life. Must, must, must. That's when we get into trouble. 
And if you're like me, determined to a fault. <laughs> As my family knows, <laughs> you know, I get in trouble because I'm so determined. You can overdo it, right? Or I get in trouble because I have a pretty clear idea of how it ought to be and other people don't see it that way and they're in my way. You know, mm, not so good, right? Not so good. Okay, just fin so do you hear it? What do you think? I'm, I'm also curious where you recommended to practice training in being. Uh huh. Yeah. Where, in addition to these meditation classes, where yeah. else would be good training? Yeah. Since becoming comes so naturally to me. Yeah. Um, very briefly, and then I want to get on to, I think, Tom here. Um, well, on your own, I mean, a really interesting thing is to say for a minute, can I simply relax into feeling content in the present? I like the word content because it is nice. It's emotionally positive, and it really speaks to the little furry animal that we are. Can this animal feel like it has enough in the present? It doesn't need to push anything away in terms of safety. It doesn't need to chase anything or grasp anything in terms of satisfaction, and it doesn't need to cling to anyone in terms of our need for connection. Just right there for a minute. Can you do that? And it's you'll as soon as you try to do it, you'll watch how tricky your mind is. How quickly it will want to imagine a threat and push it away or imagine a reward and grasp it or imagine imagine another person and pull for that social supply, you know. Yeah. So I would do that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Rick. You're good. You're good. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I'm going to mute you and shift to Tom, ask you to unmute, Tom. Great. Good. Thank you for the talk, Rick. Um, just a um, foundation question for meditation. When we are staying present or being present, are we feeling our breath or we are we controlling our breath? Okay, great. Um, if we're working with breath meditation, there it, it's possible to do certain kinds of breath meditations like pranayama, where we are controlling the breath in very specific ways. And there's I've done some of that. There are people who've done a lot of that. That's, that's a way to do it. Okay, great. Typically in sort of Vipassana, mind, you know, Buddhist Vipassana style meditating, mindfulness of breathing, mindfulness of the body. Uh, the breath is, there's not an effort to control the breath per se. We, there's an allowing of the breath to find its own natural rhythm, which typically becomes softer and lighter and, and kind of more at ease, even to the point where it's, it's almost hard to even notice the sensations of breathing. Although you must still certainly be breathing if you're, you know, alive and conscious. Uh, more broadly, that is a path into presence. There are other paths as well. We can be in the present moment while walking. We can be in the present moment while talking, uh, you know, rock climbing, something I do that tends to really bring you into the present moment, uh, whatever it might be. It's not, it's not the only way. It's, it's just a means to an end. And it's, an important, it's important not to get attached to that particular means but to keep focusing as you understand on the end itself. Thank you so much. Okay, okay, great, yeah, yeah, great. Um, if you don't know this already, Tom, you might look up a good translation of what's called the Anapanasati Sutta, mindfulness of breathing. Yeah, I can see you're familiar with it. And just working with the first four or five or six of those steps, already you're in the deep end of the pool by the time you get to the fourth or fifth of them. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, good. All right, next person, and I'm gonna keep moving because it's 7.30. Kate and Rob, looks like I'm talking with Kate. You, you, have, you have to unmute yourself. I've asked you to, there you go. Great. Uh, this is truly inspirational. And we've known people, and well, including the guy sitting next to me here who've gotten into these uh, wonderful states. Um, my concern is that many of the people on the Wednesday night calls have expressed uh, a sense that they aren't enough. And how best can, uh, you may have, in, you've, in, you've answered this indirectly, but I'd like to specifically ask a few, you to address how, um, 
how best people can not fall into that trap of their practice not being good enough, or they're becoming jealous of those whose practices aren't uh, feel they they're present. Ugh, never mind. Yeah, <laughs> we have some friends who actually are Buddhist teachers who, yeah. you know, kind of sometimes feel their practice is not enough, and it's it's hard to see. Yeah, that's a very important question. Um, I could spend considerable time on it, but I, what I want I want to try to get also to the last two people and Karen Z and Barbara Moser. So I'll just say this. Um, there are different levels of answering that question. One, of course, is to be aware of just the child, the training, the patterning we've gotten in the culture and in our own childhood in a variety of ways that teach pulls us into what Tara Brock calls the trance of unworthiness. And her book, Radical Acceptance, and her her another book uh, recently, um, all her work is fantastic, as you probably know. And uh, I'm especially fond of the first book, Radical Acceptance, and her most recent book, Trusting the Gold. They both are just profound. Uh, and so we can do the work psychologically, whether in a formal setting with a counselor or more on our own, to just try to address those feelings of inadequacy, which were very prominent for me. I've, I, I've personally really worked on this territory. So that's one thing, the psychological work of releasing self-doubt, releasing unfair self-criticism, uh, you know, stepping out of comparing mind, disengaging from those habits. You know, that's psychological work. A second piece of this is to be is to find a kind of resting in innate goodness. The Mahayana tradition, particularly Tibetan, is really strong on this. I think uh, you know the early Buddhists could learn from the Mahayanas, certainly in this regard, and and some others as well. Uh, just the sense of you know inherent wakefulness, lovingness and wisdom that's innate, that transcends achievement and performance of any kind. It's innate. It's already realized. It's already true. It may, we may not be aware of it, but it's already real. It's already true. And then if I could, um, I think the third thing I'll just say here and then I'll move on is that um, I think there is a place, and this is where I, I want to you know, I might, I might stir the waters here. I think there is a place for becoming more skillful. And one way to become more skillful is to observe one's, dare I say it, performance, <laughs> in effect. How are you doing? And to also look at people who are more skillful than you in some regard, not because you're less than them or inferior, but because you're helping yourself in wonderful and self-nurturing ways to learn from them, to see how they do it, right? And so I think that's okay. I think there's a place for feeling your way into the way of being of others whose practice maybe is a little more established or a little farther along. They relate to things in ways that might feel a little lighter, more skillful, wiser, and to learn from them. I think. I think it's okay to do that. And I, I think there are pitfalls on either side. I mean, on the one hand, there's certainly the pitfall of comparing mind. You hear someone talk and you think, damn, I don't, I just can't be there. Darn, I wish I could be there. I'm not. Okay, that's a pitfall. Watch out for it. On the other hand, there's the pitfall I, I think some teachers may have that is so fearful of other people getting caught up in feelings of inadequacy that they don't talk with them about the full possibilities of awakening. And um, so I, I try to avoid both pitfalls, I guess, and find that middle way between them. I don't know. I hope that was helpful. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to really keep rolling here. So Karen Z, I'm asking you to unmute. And by the way, other people, if you want to leave, it's really okay. Karen Z, can you unmute yourself? Great. Hello. 
Oh, hi. Oh, I looked so much better in my photo, didn't I? Okay. Most of so, us do. It's... Yes. Well, no, anyway. <laughs> Thank you for asking me because I really am having a hard time, as so many people are, uh, with what's going on in Ukraine. Yeah. And as you were talking about the three grounds, I thought, how do we make any sense of ground two and ground three when they contain a person like Putin. Yeah. And, um, you know, like I've been working so hard for several years to find that deeper level of peace and being part of the world and mm. connected. And I get this jarring, almost slap in the face when I try to do that thinking about Putin. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know how to get all of that to work together. Yeah, I, I relate. And my way into this uh, is partly I, I, is through kind of metaphor. So I think of the ocean, right? And in the ocean certainly can be very destructive storms. But the ocean altogether abides. The ocean altogether is not a problem. And to, to take your question directly, um, reality includes stars crashing together. I mean, there are estimates already that probably 100 million Earth-like planets in this galaxy. Wow. Wow. And it's hard to imagine that life hasn't formed on, on many pl places. And it's also hard to imagine that there haven't been catastrophes of just stars moving through a solar system and destroying all life. I mean, terrible catastrophes. Reality includes all of it. And to me, we can be aware of aspects of reality that we want to deal with or get away from, whether it's a storm or we, we're moved to support, as I am myself and have taken action to do so, support the people of Ukraine as they're dealing with this terrible, you know, collection of war crimes being visited upon them. And, um, you know, we can, we can do those things while recognizing that, you know, reality altogether includes all of it. And at the second level of the ground of reality together, um, it's it's just kind of hard to put in words, but when you experience it, it's um, you just get that allness is my term for it all. Allness as allness is not a problem. Allness contains many shitty things. That's a technical term. But allness altogether is not a problem. And I'm not recommending the spiritual bypass, which some people take, of just going out and being one with everything. I think that's a spiritual bypass. And I think wisdom is to recognize both truths together, both the truth of suffering and injustice and, and also hope and possibility, you know, all the, all the 10,000 sorrows and the 10,000 joys, recognizing them while also recognizing allness as allness altogether as the ground of all that. And why do we do that? Well, it's because when you do that, you, you have a sense of imperturbable peacefulness that cannot be shaken, which is a fantastic foundation for dealing with the shit in the world. And can I make one distinction though? Because sure, and then we're definitely about... gotta wrap up. <laughs> Okay. When you talk about stars colliding, I mean, that's yeah. all like, there's no intention. Whereas sure. a person like Putin is intentionally evil and right. inherently uncaring about humans. Right. And so this to me is a distinction of, and so are sure. you saying that allness includes evil? Yeah. I think reality would look at the big bang, Hitler, you know, Genghis Khan, um, terrible things, Pol Pot, you know, just all kinds of terrible things and, and stuff, we, you know, names we've never heard of, but just terrible, evil, abuse, 
ter child abuse, terrible things, you know, racism, d slavery, just treatment of w women, females, uh, girls, and and women over the uh, millennia. Just so many. Yeah, it includes all of that. It includes trees. It includes hurricanes. It gophers. It includes malice. I mean, all of it, right? All of it is. It is true. It is true. And I'm just saying. It's, it's kind of like I'm not trying to persuade you. It's more like I'm just naming a possibility and an invitation that something happens when we have a sense of allness altogether. And the great teachers talk about this. Something happens when you have a sense of allness altogether that helps you find a kind of undisturbable rest in the core of your being which is infused with compassion and is a very powerful basis upon which we can act effectively in the world. As we see in people who've had this realization of oneness, allness, they don't just sit around you know, eating donuts and laughing foolishly. They roll up their sleeves and try to help. That, that's right. kind of what the invitation It's a is. sense of power. Yeah. I better wrap up, even though as inviting as this is. Is that okay, Karen? Is yes, okay? thank you yeah, so much. Great I really appreciate it. Yeah, that's great. Okay, thank you. Okay, last. And next week, I will end on time. All right, Barbara, I'm asking you to unmute. Great. Okay, I'll try to be quick. Bring us home. Bring us All home. Right. Well, I, I guess I'm, I'm sheepish because I'm bringing it back to a very personal sort of issue. So yeah. away from the big, <laughs> the big global world. Um, but I just briefly, I'm I'm very entangled in a um, platonic relationship with another person that I can see when you're speaking. This is sort of a light bulb going off that that it's totally wrapped up in becoming, and we're pulling each other in this direction, and it's particularly painful for me because I see my part in it and I see myself pulled away from my innate goodness and kindness and it, it's really bothering me and it's really in vain. And so I'm sort of trying to grasp the potential of being instead of being pulled along, but I'm not quite sure how to disentangle myself from this other person as we both sort of pull each other in a what I consider a bad direction. So, yeah. so I'm wondering if you have any words to speak to that. Yeah. And I really appreciate everything you've been saying. Thank you. Oh, sure. Well, first, I, I do relate, you know, and I'm, you know, kind of reflecting on versions of that. One, one thing we can do is to just you know get off the battlefield for a little bit outwardly and inwardly and just sort of sit quietly for a minute or two or or longer kind of and settle and what will naturally probably happen for you Barbara and you'll feel it is you'll start to get a sense of your own kind of core of being this kind of core in you that can witness uh with compassion you know with a kind of fair witnessing of your own processes, good and bad, your own neurotic processes, your own sweet, caring, tender, lovely processes, the whole of it. You know? So there's a kind of a core of being in you that can step back from and witness your own internal mishigas, you know, all the toing and froing inside your mind, and can also see that other person and their stuff and can witness this core of your being can witness the entanglement of these two minds of these two you know two people that just that separation that i'm describing is enormously helpful and as you do that you can kind of focus more and more on what's it feel like to rest in this kind of core of being what's this feel like so that you can kind of establish yourself more there. You, you literally can almost move your body a little bit. It can kind of help to go, 
all right, you know, to, to feel what that core of being is like, distinct from neurotic reactivity in yourself or them, and then the entanglement of the two. Part, that, that's great. A second thing, if you're up for it, is to just take a breath and whew, drop your defenses and just be vulnerable with an open heart. You know, Daniel and I are gonna teach a workshop about this, this thing, this movement, this weekend, where we just, I, it's kind of a funny word, we just become more confessed in a non-religious sense. We just become more confessed with other people. Just what's what's it been like to be you? How have you been suffering? Thich Nhat Hanh, you might, his, uh, the Plum Village Sangha, his, his teaching stream, they have some lovely sentences. They're very sweet. They're almost so sweet, you kind of, <laughs> but they're really sweet. Like, you know, I am so sorry. You know, like just how it's been for you, how, how you have felt and, your fears that you've hurt your friend and, and your desires to just be at peace with each other. It doesn't mean taking any crap from them. It doesn't mean uh, self-flagellation. It's just a kind of huh, open-hearted, vulnerable realness that gets underneath it all, gets underneath the positions, gets underneath the becoming, uh, kind of rest with an open heart, and then they'll do what they do. This other person will do whatever they do, but at least you know for yourself. You've, you've come in with, with clean hands, with open hands. That's very powerful. There's a, there's a dignity and self-respect in in, in, for yourself in that position, and it, and it helps to have done that preliminary practice of kind of resting in a core of being. Yeah, that's super helpful. Thank you very much. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I'm going to definitely give that a go. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed that talk. I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free.